So today we are starting a new series and it's called Revived. And this whole series is going to be based upon a book that I picked up quite a while back. It's called Fresh Air. And it looks like this. We actually have a couple of copies in the cafe if you want to pick them up. But you can also get them on Amazon. And then also it's on Audible as well as Scribd. So you can get them digitally as well for those of you that like to lead, read that way. You won't need to read this book in order to understand this series. But if you want to elaborate on some of the things that we're talking about, if it just touches your heart, this book is going to be a huge blessing to you. So I want to show you a little verse that the book is based around. It's a very obscure verse. You've probably never heard of it. Uh, but it is about an obscure person as well. And so Paul says and gives this shout out to this guy in 2 Timothy 1. It says, may the Lord bless Onesiphorus. So any of you that are looking for children's names and you're going through books and stuff like that, this is, this is a good option for you. Onesiphorus and all of his family because he visited me and encouraged me often. His visits revived me. Now, that word revived, the Greek word literally means that he helped me recover my breath. Which, which is why this translation says that he has revived me like a breath of fresh air. And so what I've discovered as a pastor is that people, we need a lot of encouragement. And what I want to do in this series is I want to help revive some of the places of our life. If you have been, we've all been through stuff or we've been through places where we felt stuck in our life. And it can happen in all kinds of different lives, different areas, jobs, relationship, family, all of that but we feel like we're stuck in this particular situation and sometimes we don't know the way out and what I want to do is try to bring some fresh air or some revival to our hearts in those areas and so there's this concept called the doldrums have you ever heard of the doldrums so the doldrums is kind of like a term that is used to describe a depression or kind of when you go through a, a place or a, a situation where you're not going very well then you say you're in the doldrums but the doldrums is actually a real place and so you can see um, we've got a picture here along the equator there is this line of clouds right here that's the doldrums and what creates the doldrums, next slide, is that we have this tropical convergence zone. Say that real fast. And so it's that zone that's right there. It's the intratropical convergence zone. I'm smart. And so um, it's this place around the equator. And what happens is that the north hemisphere, the air spins one way. And so, and, and actually radar reflects this, but the Southern Hemisphere, everything moves in the other direction. And so where they meet in the middle, it kind of cancels the air out. And so there's no wind, there's no breath. And so back in the day before there were motors, ships and boats, if you, if you got into this place, you couldn't get out. You would die there because there was no wind. There was no breath to propel you out of that particular space. And as I read that, I just really realized, wow, what a picture of certain places in our lives sometimes. And so we're going to be there at some point in our life. We have been there at some point in our life. And so, you know, just in an area where we're stuck. And it could be in different areas in our life. It could be big, it could be small, but there's always these areas in our life sometimes that happens where we're not sure what to do. That there's, that there's no breath to get us out. There's no, we don't know what the direction is or what to do. And see, even Paul said in that scripture is that he needed to be um, revived by this guy. And so that means to be vived again. So he needed breath again. And he had gotten to a place to where he needed fresh air or to be revived. And so if, if the apostle Paul went through that, then we're probably going to go through that as well at one point or another. But the question is, so what do we do when we get there and we don't know what to do or how to get out? Or what about friends or loved ones that we find in this situation? What do we do? How do we help them? in this situation a lot of times we're lost we don't know 
And so what I'd like to do is kind of just go through and see if any of these sound familiar. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through the four stages of what we usually do when we find ourselves stuck in the doldrums. And the first one is, is that we usually start faking it, right? We can't let anybody know that we're going through this. So we just got to look like we got it all together and we got to let everybody know that we're still okay and everything's good. And, um, and so whether you're depressed or your marriage is in trouble or your kids are kind of doing what they want to do and not what you want them to do. So, and so people ask, well, hey, how's it going? Oh, I'm good. Everything's good. Smiling, you know? And so the whole way to church, you're like fighting and you're screaming and everything like that. But then you walk in the door and you get real religious, right? Praise God. We say religious stuff. We say spiritual stuff. Praise God. All's good. God is good all the time. And we do all that stuff right so we act like we've got it all together but your children are actually bleeding in children's church because of the war in the car on the way here but you can't let anybody know and honestly i think that we as christians we've gotten very good at a lot of times right but what happens is when we start going through difficulties one of the worst things you can do is just put a band-aid on that we don't actually heal it. It's still got like dirt and grime that's gonna get infected. And so, but we just put, we put a skin colored bandaid on it and we just put it there so nobody knows. In Jeremiah 6, the Bible addresses this. It says, they dress the wound of my people as though if I were not serious. See, what this is mainly talking about is to ministers, right? So we, a lot of times we'll just say, well, peace, peace, it'll be okay. Everything will be all right. And no, it won't. I'm, I'm, I'm already having a hard time. And so I love the fact that the Bible is very honest with us, right? And so this is what we need. We need a blast of fresh air. We need a revival on the inside of us because we get stuck. But if you'll hang in here with me for the next couple of weeks and just give me a slight attempt to apply some of these strategies and principles to be revived in every area of your life, and your relationship with God, then I guarantee you that it will change everything. So here's what, how we want to unpack this. Today, I want you to know that you have a choice. Because with your, when you're there, I've noticed after 25 years of pastoring, that people, when they get into the doldrums in an area of their life, they do the wrong things to get out. A lot, of teams, a lot of times people get there because they made the wrong choices, but here's the choice, is that you can do things externally. You can go through the motions and try to obey all the rules, or you can go through a transformation of the inner person. And anytime that you're trying to do those external things with nothing going on on the inside, you're going to die. You'll never get out of the doldrums. See, the gospel of Jesus is not an external gospel. Most people think that serving God is doing all the right things so that you can get God to like you. No, see, we need to get close to God so that we're inspired and motivated to do all the right things. We get it backwards. And there's always a choice between the two things. Which ones are you going to pursue? Do we try to change from the outside in or from the inside out? See, the gospel is the transformation of the inner man. That's what it is. Let me use this illustration. Uh, Melissa and I, years ago, we did a parenting class. We, we took a small group, a meetup that was a parenting class. Side note, if you want to build strong children and build strong families, you have to invest, just like this last week that we had, you have to invest in your marriages. But also, it's good if you have kids the marriage is the core of the family but also if you have children invest in parenting skills in parenting classes and parenting books how much do you love your family will be illustrated by how much you invest in them and that's through your time energy and money as well anyway so Melissa and I, we invested in this class. It was 17 weeks of parenting curriculum. And here's pretty much the bottom line of that curriculum. Everything was, was founded on this, is that we have, we have no hope in having great kids until you train the heart. See, most parenting curriculum is based upon modifying behavior of your children. So we bribe and we force and we restrict and we ground anything to get them to behave the way we want them to. And so, but, and you should do some of those things and some of those things are good. But you, if you never get to the heart, you're still going to lose. 
That's why when sometimes when they go off to college, all hell breaks loose. Why? Because they have been restricted their whole life and we got the behavior we wanted, but it was forced from the outside. Nothing had changed on the inside. The heart was not changed. So you can modify behavior. You can duct tape them to a chair. I don't, <laughs> but you could. Or you could get to the heart where they choose God. In our marriage is another example. So I'm, I'm faithful to my wife. But, but there's also a law out there that says don't commit adultery. That's one of the top ten. And I don't want to do that. And I don't want God to be mad at me or Melissa to slit my throat either. Because <laughs> that's what would happen. But I want to stay alive. <laughs> or, that, see, all that stuff's external, Right? So like, oh, you better, you better. And so every time a pretty girl walks by, it's like, woo, oh no, I better not because there's a rule and I want to stay alive. <laughs> but I'm better off if there's something that happens on the inside of me where I'm in love with her. And so if I love her, I'm not even interested. The options are not even an option if I'm in love. There's something internal that's happening. And that's a choice that I have is internal or external. In fact, the very first story of the Bible involves this choice. In Genesis chapter 2, I think we go backward. Did we skip? There we go. Did I skip a point? I did. Oh, look at me. I'm skipping stuff. All right, well, let's just pick up here. So in the middle of the garden, there was a tree of life. There was a choice that was there. And so there was the tree of the knowledge of good things and bad things. Seems to be this gravitational pull of all mankind to go to the knowledge of good things and bad things. Just tell me what to do. Just external. Just tell me what to do. But nothing had happened on the inside. And so in verse 16, if we skip ahead, in verse 16, it says, God commanded the 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 man he said you can eat of all the free of the life of you can eat of the tree of good and evil you can eat of any tree in the garden but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because if you do you'll have the doldrums you will surely die and so a lot of us are dying on the inside and our attempt to get out is not working because we're still trying to use the same thing that got us there in the first place, which is behavior modification. If I can just do the right things, if I can just measure up. And so God always wanted us to eat from the right tree, the internal tree. If there's anything that I know about the church in America, it's this, is that we have made a big deal about it, what you do and what you don't do, right? And we don't spend enough time about what has happened on the inside, right? Right? And so this is the very core of God. what God wants to do in our life is he wants our heart. And he wants our actions to be affected by our heart, not the other way around. And so here's what I want to do. I want to kind of show you the choices, these internal and external choices through these three different ways, okay? So if number one is I could just do more, right? I could just do more. A lot of us think that what God expects is for you to just do more. You need to read more. You're not reading enough chapters of the Bible. You need to read more Bible. You need to read that one-year Bible twice a year, right? You need the half-year Bible. Do more, pray more, give more, serve more. We just want, we want, we're thinking that that's gonna earn us something, that if we could just do more. And all these things can help you, but the thing is, if that's what you're trying to do to earn your way out of the doldrums, it's not gonna work. So doing more is not the solution, but the solution is receiving more. See, the fact that Jesus accomplished everything that, that we needed to do on the cross. See, there, would never, there, there will never be a bill. There never be, it's all fully paid, past, present, and future. And there's nothing else for you to do. But once again, there's always this gravitational pull toward the wrong choice, the external choice. It ha Jesus had to deal with this. In John 5, he said this. He said, you religious people. There we go. You diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them, you're going to possess eternal life. See, this is huge. He says, you missed it. 
These are the scriptures that testify about me. See, you thought reading a bunch of the scriptures is what you need to do. No, no, you were supposed to find the person behind the scriptures. And that's me, Jesus said. In other words, you refuse to come to me and have life. We have to realize that it's not how much you read. It's the person behind the scriptures. Do you meet him? Do you discover him? And if you do, you get revived. Second choice is this. Some of you think that God is mad at you. And a lot of you grow up with the, with the Wizard of Oz kind of God, you know? It's like, you know, he'll help you, but he's really grumpy about it, right? He's got that big green face, and what do you want? You know, I just want to go to heaven, I don't know. It was like, go oh, find me a broomstick, you know? So there's this, this kind of a thing. It's like, what do, what do you want me to do, God? And so we've got this thing where we have to earn his approval. He's going to be mad at us if we don't. And so I want to make him like me because he doesn't inherently like me, so I have to measure up. When I was a kid, uh, my parents would always witness to people with these tracks, and you'd hand out these tracks. And so there was this guy named Jack Chick, and he wrote these little chick tracks. Some of you might remember them. They were these little cartoon tracks. And so there were all these pictures of God, and God was always this giant faceless figure. And so and it's like all these little people and all these little tiny ants at the bottom. And he had no face. And it was like he was this angry, get away from me, God, in these tracks. Guys, that's not what God looks like. He is not trying to squash you. You don't have to try to get his approval. And so here's the other choice that you have is that you've got to realize that he already loves you. And you've got to know that he already does. See, God knows what you did this week. He was watching you, but he still loves you. Now, he might not like what you did, but he still loves you. And in fact, the more that you do that, it's like its heart is drawn even to you. It doesn't turn him off. He's not freaked out. The Bible says that when Adam and Eve chose the wrong tree, he went looking for them. Why? Because he was already in love with them. He, listen, if he had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. That's my boy right there. That's my girl. That's what he would say. Because he's already in love with you. One of my favorite verses in the, in the whole Bible uh, says this, but God demonstrates his own love for you in this. This is what he did for us. And I can just imagine this conversation between the father and Jesus. Hey, let's do this. Let's die for them while they're still spitting on us. Let's die for them before they accept us. It says he demonstrated his love that while we were still sinners, he died for us. So he wasn't laying there and just got, no, 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 don't hammer my hand yet. Are you gonna choose me? Are you, are you gonna accept me? No, while we were still spitting on him, he let us nail him to a cross because he loves us. He's in love with us. He's thinking about us right now. Isn't that cool to think about? He's thinking about you. And listen, I don't know what your view of God is, but it's probably been distorted by that other tree, by that other thing, that external thing. So the last one is that we can obey out of duty, right? It's like, don't you miss church? Because God won't like you if you do. Yeah, I, know, I knew a guy when we grew up, he thought he got points for going to church with God. And the more miserable the service was and the longer it went, the more points he got. If it was a really unbearable service, he got lots of points. And I, I had another friend that thought that's what kneeling was all about, is that God wanted you to be in pain while you pray. That helps you connect with him. What in the world? This is their view of God. We have the wrong mindset sometimes that we've chosen external as opposed to internal. Listen, I grew up a pastor's kid. And the world, I remember, the world was way nicer to people, way more accepting to people than, you know, in the church, everybody's all serious. And you, I saw you last week and you were wearing your hat backwards. And, you know, that is not a good, you know. And, and it's like, well, let's just, I've got the joy of the Lord. <laughs> I'm happy. And it's like, seriously? There was this cognitive dissonance between what they said they believed and what the Bible taught and how they acted. I was confused because I would see them. You know, the thing was, is I love God. I just didn't like Christians a whole lot, you know? And 
I, I, I grew up with some mean Christians. Some of y'all are mean. You're just mean. And as a pastor's kid, I saw that. I saw, nobody in here is mean. It's everybody, it was the other service that all the mean people went to. <laughs> I remember my parents pouring into the lives of people. They were there when they were going through just the depths, the lowest depths of the depths. And they were, they were there when children passed away. They were there when spouses passed away. They were there through divorces. They were there when children were born and they were there for marriages. And they were there and they sacrificed their life for the people and the sheep that God had given to them. And then I saw that when one little thing happened or for whatever reason, it's like, yeah, I think we're leaving. We're going somewhere else. And they had poured their heart and their soul invested in and so it's like, nah, that does, it's like they're changing grocery stores. I mean, I saw this happen over and over. And, and as a kid growing up, look, I love God with all my heart, but I didn't want to have anything to do with that. But a lot of times that's because people are trying to measure up from the outside and not realizing that Jesus already paid and, and, and we've left the internal and just living out of the internal for the external. And so that can be hard. See, the Bible, let me tell you, the, all the rules in the Bible, that's hard. You can't do that externally. That's the whole point is that you need Jesus living on the inside of you. It's living on the inside out. Or it can be hard unless, you're, unless you're, you're living out of delight. See, the Bible says that his commands are no longer burdensome because of this. See, whether it's a rule or a law or a command or a promise, you know what? But if you love God, it's like, if you don't love God, it's like, oh, that's gonna be hard. That's a bunch of rules. I don't wanna do all that stuff. But if you're in love, you're happy to. It's a delight. In fact, I wanna show you this verse. Jesus said, if you love me, you will do what I command. And so this has both those choices, external versus internal in this. And every one of us are on one side or the other of that comma in the middle. And so for some of us, this is what I heard. If you love me, you will obey what I command. You will prove to me that you love me because you'll do what I tell you to do. And that's how you see that. Or you're on the other side of it. And that is, if you love me, you'll, you'll do what I command. If you love me, trust me, don't worry about it. You will automatically do those things. See, it becomes the byproduct, not the command. It becomes who you are, not what you have to do. So many of us have that backwards. That choice, internal versus external, is right here in this scripture. And I want, to, I want to just tell you a little bit, just in closing, a little bit about my story and how I came to know Christ myself. When I was seven years old, I answered an altar call and I went down and I, I prayed the prayer and, and I could repeat all the stuff that I understood in, in Sunday school and everything that was told me and I believed those things. And I loved God with all of my heart and I wanted to serve him. But at seven years old, for me, I didn't own my own life. My parents owned my life, so I couldn't give it away. And so it, for me, it wasn't a choice. It was just a direction I was led. It was a good direction. It was a right direction. But then as I grew up, although the truth was all around me, internal versus externally, somehow I had a hard time grasping it. And as I grew up to be a teenager, I began to test my boundaries as sometimes teenagers do. And I wanted to be my own person and make my own choices because I felt like all my choices had been made for me. And so there was this external performance and, the, and I was trying to measure up and I would fall short and fall short. And I would continually fall short and I began to, it began to affect me on the inside because I felt like I had to prove that I loved God and I was doing a bad job at it. I was on the other side of that comma. And so I continually just felt like I couldn't measure up and I couldn't measure up and I couldn't measure up and it, and it pushed me farther and farther from God and I began to make poor choices, wrong choices. And whenever I would look at Christians who were mean or miserable, who would say one thing, put a certain smile on at church, but then I knew how they acted outside of their Christian contexts and how they spoke and what they did. And so going through all these stages, I had pretty much, uh, of the doldrums, I had pretty much given up. And, and I didn't know how to get out. And so I remember sitting on the floor of my bedroom 
as a teenager and I had found this verse and I wish I could remember what it was. I don't remember what it was, but this is what it spoke to me in that moment and I'll never forget. God said to me, listen, you're never gonna measure up and that's okay. I love you anyway. And so if you would just rest in me, if you'll just fall in love with me, if you'll just give your life to me, then I will grow you and I will develop you from the inside out. And so that night in my bedroom, in a junior in high school, I gave my life to Christ. And it was night and day difference. Not because I was trying to perform or measure up or do what I thought was right, but because something internally inside of me occurred. And I went to the school the next day and I was in love with Jesus, in love with my Bible. I carried my Bible through the hallways. People were like, what's up with Corona? <laughs> Toting a Bible around. And I began to change. And people were, they were utterly confused by what was going on because it was overnight inside out that I began to change. I remember going to a house and, uh, and they were rolling a joint and, I, and I, they offered me some. I said, no, 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 oh yeah, you, you'll get, you know, your parents will smell it on you when you get home. It's like, no, it's not that. I had, for the first time ever, I had a, it, it, was, it was this internal choice. It was something from the inside out. I had no desire. It was a love of Jesus. I'd never cheat on him. And it just naturally manifested itself in me. And listen, there, there were always been temptation and there were temptations and that kind of thing, but there was a love on the inside of me where I, the same way that I'm faithful to my wife, not because of a rule, but because I love her, I was faithful to God because I loved him. And so that day, that night in my room, my life changed forever from the inside out. And that is the choice that we have to make. Matthew 7, Jesus says this. I want, he said, I want you to listen. There's going to be a lot of people who choose wrongly. They came, they did all these wonderful things. They did all these external things. They went to church and it, it says they even cast out devils. But there was nothing going on on the inside. And, and he says, look, I hate to tell you, but you're not going to make it. Because I never knew you. And so... It was the first time in my life that I understood that the condition of my eternal life had nothing to do with my performance, but it had to do with my relationship with God, which I knew was non-existent at the time. And so there in my bedroom, in the floor, I just said, God, I don't want any of this stuff. I just want you. And if you will save me, I will love you more than anybody I know. I'll give you absolutely everything. And at the time, I came the most on fire Christian that I, had, that I had ever seen at the time. That's been over 30 years ago. And I've, I've had tough days and I've had, I've had doldrums and I've had all that kind of stuff, but it's been the best journey of my life. And I just wanna give you this principle to remind you, fall in love with Jesus. Choose the internal and the external will come into place. Fall in love with Jesus.